Well, hey, church, it, it really is good to be with you this morning. Um, if you do have a Bible, please please turn with me to, to Acts chapter 2. This is where we're going to be camping out this morning. I hope that you have uh, been enjoying or at least enjoyed the first sermon of Acts uh, chapter 1. Uh, last week, Pastor Tyler brought a great message and really introduced us into this new sermon series on the book of Acts, which the first part we're going to be focusing on is the birth of the church. And we're really going to get to see that take place this morning in, in Acts chapter 2, that, that the church is born in the world. And so if you don't have a Bible, please know that there are some Bibles on the inside chairs of each row. You can follow along there, or you can follow along on the screen behind me. But we're, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, and we're going we're gonna to try to we're going to try to cover almost every verse here in the book. And so uh, bear with me this morning. There, there, there's a lot that we're going to be looking at. Uh, but I believe the Lord has a great message for us this morning. And so before we, we dive into his word, let, let's pray again and just ask the Lord to lead us this morning. Father, I do thank you so much again uh, just for this gathering. And Lord, as we come to the, to the preaching of your word, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, just open our hearts. And Lord, I just pray that you would open our minds, uh, Lord, so that we could hear from you this morning, that we would be able to understand really what, what you want to speak to us in Acts chapter 2. God, and I just pray by your spirit that you would help us to apply it in our lives. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would move uh, in a great way to this morning. Lord, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Well, if, if you've lived for, for long enough, you, you know that throughout the year, uh, you have good days and bad days, right? There, there, there's some days that you really want to, to relive, and, and there's other days that you wish you, you, you didn't have to live. Uh, but each year, there, there are days that we always look forward to. And so may, maybe some of you are here this morning and, and you have been just fed up with, with the hot and cold, cold and hot that, that the Wyoming spring has brought us here. And you're really looking forward to the consistent days like today, the summer, the summer days, to so where you can go out and enjoy the summer, the outdoors. Now, me and my family each year, we always look forward to the day of, of Thanksgiving. When, when Thanksgiving comes, I know it's going to be a good day in the Anding house. Because my wife, Brianna, she's, she's going to be in the kitchen, and she's going to be making some homemade dressing. She's going to be whipping up some mashed potatoes, and she's going to bake my favorite, a pecan pie. And so it really doesn't matter how the cowboys play on Thanksgiving Day in, in the Anding house. Uh, all, all that matters is I know I'm going to be able to eat what I really want to eat on that day. And so we look forward to Thanksgiving, and each of you are, uh, each year, you, you look forward to a certain day. We are always waiting for a certain day. And so at the end of, of Acts chapter 1, this is what we find the apostles doing. They are waiting, waiting on, on the day that the Holy Spirit would come. Jesus had, had given them their mission to go and make disciples of all nations. But before they went, he commanded them to wait. To wait in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, and in a few days, the Spirit would come. Because these men desperately needed the Holy Spirit. Jesus was calling them to go beyond the boundaries that he went, but he was also promising them the same help he had. Just as the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus, empowering his ministry, the Holy Spirit was to come upon these men and empower them in the ministry that God had given them. And so they waited. Every Christian here today has a mission from God. You have a ministry to fulfill in your life. And we as well desperately need the Holy Spirit. I mean, we, we, in a sense, we, we need the Holy Spirit running through our veins. We 
need his presence. We need his power. We need him to be active all around us, transforming our lives. And so 10 days, these men waited, praying, watching. And then all of a sudden, the day came. Just as Jesus said, the Spirit came. And that is what we are going to see in Acts chapter 2, is that the Holy Spirit came into the world. It came to these men. And it, it comes in a way like never before. And it, it changes the course of history. And, and it gives birth to the church of Jesus Christ. And so today we, we are going to see that the Spirit comes. And so look with me starting in reading verses 1 through 4 here in Acts chapter 2. This is, this is what Luke writes to us about the day that the Spirit comes. Starting in verse 1, he writes, When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The first thing that, that I want you to see in, in the Spirit coming here that I think Luke points out to us here is that the Spirit comes to fill with power. I met some of our people made jokes. It, it, it doesn't mean that it came to, to they, they, they could feel it, but that it came to live inside of them and fill them with power. Luke tells us here the exact day that the Spirit came. It's the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was a day that the Jews looked forward to. It was a day of celebration and, and filled with great joy. It was a, it was a festival that, that the Jews held every year, also known as the Feast of Weeks, where they would come together in Jerusalem at the temple and offer up to God the first fruits of the wheat harvest for that year. And so this, this really, they, they were offering up the first fruits of the wheat, the, the, lo, the first loaves of bread. And really, who doesn't like to come together and enjoy a meal and a celebration of bread, right? We all love to eat bread. And so this, this was a gathering of offering up first fruits, but it also was a very well-attended feast, most likely the most well-attended feast out of the three that they had each year. The, the, the Feast of Pentecost took place in late, in late May and early June, which meant good weather and good traveling condition. And so this feast was not only uh, able to be visited and attended by the Jews who were in Jerusalem or, or around the sound, uh, surrounding area, but this feast was, was made available for Jews that lived far, far away. In other words, many Jews came to this feast. Again, it, it was a day where many Jews came together to worship God, thanking Him for His provision, thanking Him for His provision for the wheat crop that year. And so really the day that the Spirit comes is a great truth that God's timing is always perfect, right? God, God, had, God could have chosen to, to send the Spirit on any day, and, and any day that He had chosen would, would have been a great day, a good day. But what we see here in Luke writing that the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost was that God chose the best day, that God chose the perfect day to send the Spirit and this, and this is how God operates in your life and in my life. I mean, God provides. He helps. He 
He moves just at the right time. God here couldn't have chosen a better day to send the Spirit. And so what a picture that God gives us here of the spiritual reality that is going to take place on this day. No one knew that that this was going to happen, but God did. It was his plan. And he starts by providing what he promised on this day. It's on this day, the day of Pentecost, that that verse 2 tells us suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were saying. This sound that, that came from heaven, this was the Holy Spirit. The disciples had been waiting, but as we can see here, the Spirit had been waiting as well. The Spirit was waiting on Jesus to say go. And as Jesus commanded to go, the Spirit right here went. And the Spirit came quickly. Right? It says as, as he entered into the house, it, his presence made a violent sound, a strong rushing wind sound, and it filled the whole house. I mean, that the Holy Spirit made it audibly clear to the disciples who had stepped into the room. It was him. He, he had arrived. He was there. All of him. The fullness of him. But the disciples not only heard the Spirit come, but Luke tells us here that they even saw the Spirit. Verse 3, they, they saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. These tongues like flames of fire were a visual of the Spirit's presence to these disciples. As I read in my study, fire was frequently used in the Old Testament as a symbol of God's presence, right? The, the burning bush, the pillar of fire by night, the, the fire in the tabernacle, all these are pointing to God's presence. And these, flame, these tongues that were flames of fire, they were pointing to the, that the presence of the Spirit was resting upon each disciple there. These disciples were witnessing the presence of the Spirit, the Spirit. And they were witnessing how the presence of the Spirit would continue to work in their lives. As, as the visual of tongues was pointing to the Spirit coming upon them to speak through them. That this Holy Spirit would empower their speech. It would, would, would empower their own tongues. But in verse 4, we, we see the critical change that Jesus brought to all his disciples here. They not only heard and saw the Spirit, they not only had the Spirit resting upon them, but verse 4 tells us, then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Unlike the Old Testament saints that, that we see in Scripture, where, where the Spirit rested upon some and, and not others. Where the Spirit, because of sin, left King Saul, that, that the power of the Spirit left Samson. Unlike Old Testament saints, all those who believe in Jesus Christ right now, they are filled with the Spirit. In other words, because, because Jesus died for all sins, completely removing them between us and God by being nailed to the cross, Jesus has not only made peace, brought peace with, with God, but, but he has brought you into real fellowship with God that, that God now comes, live, and comes and lives inside of you. This these men right here, they are the first fruits, the first ones in all of history to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The presence of God was now not in the temple. The presence of God was now in the body, in the lives of these disciples, and not just the apostles. 
the Spirit, it says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. All 120 disciples right in this moment were filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what, what, we, what we see here is the Spirit coming to fill the disciples. It came to fill them with the presence of God, to fill them with the power of God, so that they could fulfill the mission that God had given them. And listen, this, this is a great day of thanksgiving for these disciples. They, they now have the complete power of God, presence of God to do what Jesus had commanded them to do. It's a day of celebration. And listen, if, if you're a believer here today, you've had a day just like this one. You've had a day like this one, a day of great thanksgiving where, where, where God filled you with the Holy Spirit. But, but unlike these disciples here, you didn't have to wait 10 days for the Spirit. Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 13 says that you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit when you believed. The very moment that you, that, the moment that you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that very moment the Spirit came and entered your life fully and completely, never to leave you or forsake you. God has given you everything that you need, believer, to live out the Christian life, to, to do what Jesus has commanded you to do. And listen, it's there to stay. It doesn't matter if, if, if you fall short some, from time to time. It, it, it doesn't matter if, if, you're, if you feel like you're in, insufficient for, for the task that he's given you. Listen, you have everything you need in what God has given you through the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, I, I just pray that you would reflect and that you would remember that moment that you were filled with the Spirit. That, that you would just think about how the Spirit of God has been moving in your life just here recently. And that that would lead you this morning to thank Jesus for what He's done, what, what He has given you in the Spirit. And so first we see that the Spirit comes to fill with power. But the Spirit didn't just come to fill these disciples. It also came to draw others to what God was doing. And we see this in verses 5 through, through 13 here. We see that the Spirit also comes to draw. Picking back up in, in verse 5, it says, Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Croatians and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one, one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. The Spirit also comes to draw. Luke tells us here in verse 5, Now on the same day, many Jews were staying in Jerusalem. Again, this is, this is Pentecost. This is a Jewish festival. And there were Jews, as he says, from every nation under heaven. Now, Luke isn't, isn't telling, saying this, that, that Jews came from all around the world, the entire world. No, 
they came from the world that, that they knew, which, which was the Roman Empire, which was a big, a big area. They, they had come from every place where the Jews had been dispersed throughout their history that, that we see in the Old Testament. Luke here mentions 15 nations in verses 9 through 11. And again, they're, they're all over the Roman Empire. I'm not going to repeat some of the nations that, that Luke writes here because I know I mispronounced some of them. But, but I just want you to know that it, it's, they're all over the map. They, they were south of Jerusalem, east of Jerusalem, north, northwest. I mean, it, it was all over the R Roman Empire. But what's most important that, that you know about this is that these are 15 different speaking nations, 15 different languages here. One, comment, one commentator pointed out that Luke seems to group these nations in linguistic categories. In other words, there, there were Jews from even more nations here, but, but what Luke wants to really stress to us is the difference all the different languages that were present here on this day. And there were, there were many of them. And though the Jews there spoke many different languages, they did have one thing in common. As verse 5 also tells us, they were devout people. Devout people. Now listen, in America, when we talk about and think about being devout or devoted, I think I think we, we really don't understand just how devout these people are. I mean, we're, we're, we are devoted to work, right? And then we're, we can be very devoted to come home and, and binge on, on our favorite TV series. And, and if you're like me, you're, you're really devoted to finishing the whole carton of Oreos at the house. I eat about four nights. And so, uh, and so I'm, I'm pretty committed. But these, these Jews, they, they were... They were devout people, Luke wants, to, wants us to know this. And th this word devout here means they were extremely religious. They were completely committed to the law and, and their traditions. They were people who deeply respected God. Listen, some of them could have traveled 500 miles, 25 to 50 days just to be here at this feast while others had, had chosen to stay from, from the first festival, the, the Feast of Passover, which, which, was, which was exactly 50 days prior. Listen, they, they were devout people, most certainly focused on all the preparations in the schedule of this day of, 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 the, of Pentecost, they were focused on everything that, that was happening on the day of Pentecost until the Spirit came. In verse 6, when, when this sound occurred, when, when the Spirit came, it says, these people as well heard it. And when they heard it, they immediately were drawn to this sound. It says, when this sound occurred, it says, a crowd came together. And this word crowd here means, it means to fill, to make, to make full. In other words, it wasn't just a handful of people that gathered together. It, it was a crowd that filled the street. It, it was a full crowd, a large crowd. That there's estimations that say it easily could have been 15 to 30,000 people that gathered in one place in this moment. An example of, of in, our, in our day and time of this is, maybe some of you know this, but there's a college student gathering called Passion in Atlanta, Georgia. And each year at the start of, of each new year, thousands upon thousands of college students, they travel all from the world, all around the world, travel to Atlanta, Georgia, to Mercedes-Benz Stadium, to gather together and to worship and to grow in Jesus. Listen, this year in 2024, 55,000 college students gathered together at, at Atlanta, Georgia for, for the event of Passion. It, it is a mass gathering 
of college students. And, that, and that's what's happening here. It, that it's a mass gathering of Jews. And each one that was there, each one was drawn by the Spirit. Each one heard the Spirit coming. And as they gathered, they, they were confused as verse, continue, as verse 6 continues to say, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. So they, they were all drawn there by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit had empowered all 120 disciples to speak not in angelic language like we saw in 1 Corinthians, that type of speaking in tongues, but here it empowered them to speak in all the languages that were present of the people that day. So this was an incredible moment. The people, I mean, they were astounded and amazed at what they were hearing and seeing in these disciples' lives. And it shows us that God is drawing many people by the Spirit. Many. It was not only harvest time for wheat, but it was harvest time for people of every language and nation, first starting with the Jews, for them to hear and see, as verse 11 says, the magnificent acts of God. Because the gospel is for them too. The gospel is for every people of every language and of every nation. And so this, this truth here that God is drawing people by the Spirit, this is true in your life, in my life as well, today. That God is continuing to draw men and women to Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And just as the Spirit here puts a crowd before the disciples, the Spirit will put people before you in your life who are being drawn to Jesus. And you know the reason why the Spirit's going to put them in front of you? Because you know Jesus. You're filled with the Spirit. Listen, these people were devout to God, but they weren't devout to Jesus Christ. They were still missing Jesus. And so the Spirit draws them to the ones who truly knew Jesus, that, who truly knew what was happening in this moment. And listen, the, the Spirit may not put a crowd of thousands before you, but, but you just need to know He's going to put people before you. And so you just need to look in your life and see who is gathering before you. Right, if you, who, who's gathering before you right now in your life? If you're a boss, your, your employees who, who have to answer to you. Right, your children who are constantly coming to you because, because they need you, they, they need something. Right, your friends in your life. Listen, all these people are being put before you so that they would hear and see Jesus. So I, I can remember meeting a church planner from, from Vermont. If, if today you think my accent is thick, his, his was far more thick than mine. Uh, the, the man, was, I, think, I think he was from Georgia, from one, Georgia or the Carolinas. But, but him and his wife moved to Vermont, Vermont to plant a church. And when they moved there, he, he stuck out as a sore thumb. Right? His, his accent, people constantly were coming up to him and asking him, Man, where are you from? You know, what, what are you doing here? And there for a while, he, he, would, he would tell them where he's from and tell them that he was here to plant a church. But then one day, he, he just began to realize, man, these people aren't just coming to me because of me. They're coming to me because Jesus is drawing them to me. Listen, I'm not, he, he shared with us, I'm not, I didn't just move to Vermont just to plant a church and just to make my name known. I truly did move to, to Vermont to share Jesus with people. And so he began just steadily, had that change of mindset that those who were drawn to him, just drawn to his accent, drawn to, to what he's doing, realize 
And Jesus really is drawing them to me to, to hear the good news, the gospel. And that's the same, believer, that's the same in your life. Anybody that takes interest in you, anybody that's, that's put before you, don't, don't miss out on that. That is God's Spirit drawing them to, to you who knows Jesus, for you to share Jesus with them. And so that's exactly what is happening here. People were being drawn to hear about Jesus. And they're asking the right question, what does this mean? What does this mean? So we, we, we continue in the text, and we not only see that the Spirit comes to feel and that the Spirit comes to draw, but, but thirdly, we see here that the Spirit comes to glorify Jesus. And we see this in verses 14 through 36. As so much, so much here was going on that that verse 12 says the people were, were perplexed. They were, they were really at a loss. They, they couldn't wrap their minds around what was actually taking place. And so they, they couldn't understand what, what all this meant. And so as, as many of the voices of the disciples began to, to die down, a single voice began to rise here. And, it's in, and we see this in verse 14. It says, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. This single voice that rises amongst these disciples is the voice of Peter. It's a voice that has changed drastically. I mean, just, just a little over 50 days ago, Peter was following Jesus from a distance in the dark. He sat down by a campfire and denied Jesus three times. And he was found weeping bitterly and filled with guilt. But here, but, but before some of the same people who had put Jesus to death, Peter steps into the light in the lead for Jesus. Peter stands up and proclaims the truth. Peter is found filled with power and boldness. We don't see the same Peter here that we saw some 50 days ago. Peter has been transformed. Peter has been made new by the Holy Spirit. And his life in this moment is really glorifying Jesus. The Spirit empowered Peter at this moment, moment really to glorify Jesus. That with Jesus there is grace and forgiveness. That with Jesus there is real new life and power that you can have with him. And listen, some, for some of you, th th this really is a picture of your life. Some of you at one point were, ru were ruining your life with drugs and alcohol. And Jesus stepped in and changed your life. Jesus was the one who transformed you and made you clean that, that now you are filled with the Spirit and walking in self-control. Right? Others of you have experienced tragic events in your life, hard times. And Jesus has used those moments, used those things in your life, and now has placed you in a position to minister to others. What, what, what seemed bad and, and what was bad in the world, Jesus turned it around and he's using it for good in your life. And some of you used to be depressed, right, filled with, with guilt and with shame. But with Jesus now, you, you are filled with, with hope. You're filled with peace, with joy. Listen, Jesus has transformed many of your lives by the Holy Spirit, Outfitter Church. Listen, I know it. I've seen it. I've witnessed it. 
with my own, with my own two eyes. And listen, in, in, instead of, of you shrinking back and hiding your life, I think what we're seeing in Peter's life here is that God is calling you to step up and to step out to glorify him. Like in whatever, in whatever he's calling you to do. I, I don't know what Jesus is calling you to do here this morning, but I know he's calling you to do something. And instead of you shrinking back and hiding, listen, that you've been given the spirit to glorify Jesus. The scripture we read earlier, 2 Timothy 1, 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. Listen, God, hear this this morning. God wants to use you to glorify Jesus. For you, for you to enjoy him and to praise him and to worship him in your life. Jesus had, had called Peter to feed his sheep. Jesus had called Peter to preach. And that's what we see here Peter doing. It wasn't by his own doing or by, by his own works, but it was because of the grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was because of Jesus. And Peter preaches. This is, this is the first sermon in the book of Acts, and it's a powerful one, and we don't have all the time to really walk through everything that, that Peter preaches here. But, but what we also see here is one of the main ways that the Spirit empowers us in our lives to glorify Jesus is to really speak about Jesus, is to proclaim Jesus, is to, is to share Jesus. So again, I, I don't know what God is calling you to do this morning, but, but I do know one thing. He's calling you to open your mouth and to share Jesus with others. It's one of the most glorifying things that you can do for, in your life to glorify Jesus. And so Peter does this. Peter, Peter in verse 15, he speaks to the crowd and he says, For these people are not drunk as you suppose, and it's only nine in the morning. And then he goes on to explain that what you're seeing and witnessing is that God has sent his own spirit upon these disciples. God has sent the spirit, poured out his spirit just as he prophesied in the Old Testament. And But Peter doesn't just want them to know that God's spirit has come here. Peter wants them, the reason that God has poured out his spirit here is because of what God first did in sending his son, Jesus Christ. So look, look with me in, in a couple of verses here. We're going to be kind of quickly go through this. But Jesus, but, but Peter begins to speak and preach about Jesus Christ. Starting in verse 22, he says, Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth, was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you, you, you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. Verse 24, God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. Get down with me to verse 32. God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And so the thing that, that Peter here does is he makes certain to these Jews who, who, who nailed Jesus to the cross, he makes it certain that Jesus is the one 
who's done, who's done this. Jesus is, is the Savior. He is the Lord of the world. And he, and he makes it clear by, by basically pre- preaching the gospel to them. So the reason that the Spirit comes is, is because first Jesus came. He tells these Jews that, that Jesus came and, and he was from God. That Jesus Christ, though he was a man, he, he was God in flesh. God in flesh. And because Jesus put on flesh, it tells us who he, who he came for. He came for you and me. He identified with those he came for. And that Jesus was, was nailed to the cross, not only by these sinful men, but, but Jesus was nailed to the cross because that was God's plan. God's plan was to send his only son and put all the sin on the world upon him and nail the punishment for it on the cross to his son. And so Peter continues saying that Jesus didn't stay dead, though, but Jesus rose from the dead. That the one that you put to death is actually now alive and is seated at the right hand of God. And he's the one who is now sending the Spirit into the world to fill people with God's presence and God's power. And so Peter makes it very clear to them that Jesus is the Son of God who is the Savior and who is truly Lord. And in this, Peter glorifies Jesus Christ. That as, as the, though these people were devout, there was no way for them to earn their forgiveness. That though these people were, were desperately trying to obey the law and to please God, they never could on their own. And so he offers to them the hope of the gospel that Christ came for each one of them. And listen, this morning, you may have heard the gospel many times But maybe this morning, the Holy Spirit is helping you to truly understand that God sent Jesus for you. That just as as Jesus drew each one of these people here, God has drawn you this morning to hear this truth, this one truth. That God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for your sin and to rise from the dead to give you eternal life, forgiveness of sin. He did that personally for you. And this is the gift of the gospel, that there is real forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And so, church, this is, this is what God wants you to share with people, that is the gospel. Peter, Peter proclaims it in, in, in a way more powerful way than I ever could in this moment. But listen, God isn't asking you and calling you necessarily to be a preacher. God is just simply calling you to glorify Jesus by sharing Jesus with others. And so lastly, we, we see here in, in our text in Acts chapter 2 here is that the Spirit comes to save. As Peter opens his mouth here and, and, and shares the gospel to each one of these Jews, in, verse, in verses 37 through 41, it says, When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes saved. Church, your responsibility is to share the gospel. It's the Spirit's responsibility to save. And that's what we see here at the end of Acts chapter 2 here. Is that the Spirit, as Peter speaks, it says it pierced their hearts and led them to cry out, what should we do? How can we be saved? And as as Julianne comes up 
here to close us out in worship. How anyone can be saved is simply by what Peter says, is repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. It's you choosing to to turn from your sinful ways, your your rebellion against God, and simply trusting in what he's done. That you you would believe he really came to save you, died, died on the cross for you and that you would surrender to follow him all the days of your life. The promise, the promise for this, as verse 39 says, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Church, your, your responsibility, again, is not to, not to save people, but it's just to share the gospel. And it's God's God's responsibility to call and to save by his spirit. So this morning, if if you're here this morning, and maybe you are like these Jews, you're convicted in your heart that you need to trust in Christ, that you need to surrender your life to him. I'm just I'm just gonna lead you in a in a prayer that for you to do that. Listen, it takes you in your heart doing this, trusting Christ and surrendering to him to be saved. But this is a simple way for you to confess that to him. Listen, church, I hope this morning you were encouraged that that God has filled you with his spirit, empowered you to live this mission. And, And there's a spirit that is actively at work all around you to empower you to share the gospel, but also to save those right in front of you. So pray with me this morning as we close in worship. For the person who wants to accept Christ, please pray with me. Lord Jesus, Lord, just as you drew these Jews, Lord, I I feel that you're drawing me to yourself this morning. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for me. Lord, and I believe you're alive and calling me to follow you. Lord, today I give you my life. Please save me. In your name, Jesus. Listen, if you if you made a decision to follow Christ today, please fill out one of the connect cards in a chair by you. Would love to know that. Would love to, to come by you as well and, and to encourage you and to help you walk in your new relationship with Christ. But pray with me and we'll end in a worship song. Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you so much that on this day that you you saved not just one or two people, but you saved over 3,000 people. Lord, that brought the birth of your church in the world. Where the gospel message could, wouldn't just stay in Jerusalem, but that would go to many nations and to many people that speak many languages. Lord, I pray that you would help us to follow you in obedience in sharing this good news. Lord, thank you so much. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.